Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the 12th of August weekly market review. I hope everyone had a good rest over the long weekend of the National Day. And today, I, as usual, I have with me Mr. Gerald Wong. How are you, Gerald? Very good. Um, Had a enjoyable and restful long weekend. Uh, it was good to see the National Day Parade and also seeing Singapore win a bronze medal in the Olympics. Uh, so it was a fairly joyous long weekend. Yes, definitely a lot of things to learn from the Japanese uh, Olymp uh, not Japanese Olymp the Singapore Olympians also their attitude that uh, that they have it is by not winning uh, any medal but at least we have a uh, bronze medal now. Uh, also last week we had the most volatile week of this year 2024 in the financial markets where there's a Japanese carry trade issues where there's a lot of unwinding of the Japanese yen, unwinding of US equity back to buying the Japanese yen. And then we also have some data from the U.S. side, which caused uh, the markets to be very volatile, but managed to recover most of those losses in the later part of the week. So, Gerald, will you help us to unpack what happened in the market last week? Yes, sure. Um, so, as usual, we start with the disclaimer that today's sharing is for information purposes only and should not be taken to be financial advice. Okay, uh, we have an upcoming webinar on the 21st of August. Uh, this is an RCR session that is free and exclusive for members. So if you have got more detailed questions, uh, do join the session uh, where Sunny and I will help answer your questions. Uh, if you find the weekly market review helpful, do leave us a review on Google. Um, and if you are wondering how you can join CIS as a member, you can scan this QR code or go to the website. Okay, so um, like Sunny mentioned, we had a very volatile week, um, but for the US markets at least, uh, we managed to see that the S&P 500 eventually closed the week about flat at the 5,344 level, uh, while the Nasdaq and Dow Jones saw slight losses, okay? Uh, for the STI, um, we actually suffered more significant losses. Uh, we are now back to below the 3,300 level at 3,262 after a 3.5% correction in the STI last week. Okay, so fairly significant movements. Uh, you rarely see the STI falling by more than 3% in a single week. So what actually happened, um, I think this was something that uh, Sunny mentioned earlier, uh, it relates to the carry trade. And if you're wondering how does that actually work, uh, so basically you have got some currencies with the countries that offer lower interest rates, such as in Japan. So we have seen that Japan has had interest rates that are close to 0% for quite a number of years. So effectively what some traders and investors might have been doing uh, is to borrow from such a market where the interest rates are low. Uh, and then change it into a currency with a market that offers a higher interest rate, such as in the US, to be earning the higher yield. Okay, so now with expectations that the Fed might start to cut interest rates, and also with the recent increase in interest rates by the Bank of Japan, uh, we are starting to see this carry trade actually unwinding. Okay, so this is why you see the Nikkei 225 falling by more than 12% last Monday in the most significant decline since 1987. A big part of it has actually got to do with the unwinding of this trade. Okay, so like I mentioned earlier, we started to see the Bank of Japan uh, raising interest rates uh, over the past few months. Um, so that is once again helping to exacerbate the movements. But because further down uh, last week, uh, the Bank of Japan governor actually came out to assure that uh, they are unlikely to further raise interest rates in an unstable financial environment. So that has actually helped the Nikkei 225 to recover and the global financial markets to stabilize slightly. Okay, so one of the key things that we'll keep a lookout for would be this movement in the Japanese yen versus the US dollar. Uh, for many of us who have been traveling to Japan, you probably realize that the Japanese yen has weakened uh, over the past year. But if you were to look at the past few weeks, uh, the Japanese yen has strengthened very significantly versus the USD. 
And this is something that effectively would reflect the unwinding of the carry trade. Okay, so we'll continue to keep a lookout for this as to whether the Japanese yen continues to strengthen versus the USD. Okay, uh, another indicator to keep a lookout for would be US bond yields as well as Singapore government bond yields. Okay, so uh, we saw this very big dive in your US government bond yields. And likewise, in Singapore, we saw the 10-year government bond yield falling very significantly over the past two weeks. Okay, uh, from above 3%, at one point, it fell to below 2.7%. Uh, with some of the more positive U.S. economic data that came out, uh, once again, we saw a bit of a recovery later in last week. Um, so that we are now at a 2.86% level, still down below the 3% level, but recovering a bit from the low of 2.7%. Okay, so what do we have to keep a lookout for? Um, definitely expectations of the U.S. interest rate cuts. Okay, uh, so we have seen quite significant movements in terms of expectations of the Fed rate cuts. Um, I think at this point in time, investors are putting in almost 100% probability that the Fed will cut interest rates in September. But the question is whether it will be a 0.25% or 0.5% rate cut. Okay. Uh, if I were to look at the data early last week, then effectively investors are expecting that there's a high possibility of the Fed cutting interest rates by 50 basis points. But when I checked again yesterday, uh, it is now about 50-50 between uh, 25 basis points and 50 basis points rate cut. But if I were to look at the November meeting, then that is where investors are now expecting that there's a higher possibility of a 0 0.5 percentage point rate cut. So either way, we might actually see a 75 basis points or 0.75% cut by November this year. Okay, so one thing that I'll be keeping a look at very closely is this change in interest rate expectation. Uh, I put out the change in the probabilities for the November meeting. And you see here, we have seen quite significant changes, uh, whether is it uh, 25 basis points, 50 basis points, or 75 basis points rate cut by November this year, okay? So it's something that we'll keep a lookout closely for to understand what is the interest rate trajectory and whether that may lead to a further unwinding of the carry trade. Okay, um, closer to home, um, we saw that the STI had a loss of 3.5% last week, uh, but there were still some stocks that had gains, okay? Uh, this was led by some of the Jardine related names such as Hong Kong Land, Jardine Madison, Jardine Cycle and Carriage. Uh, but there were also two companies that reported results and having their share price having a bit of a bounce after, including Semcom Industries and SGX. Okay, in terms of top losers, uh, we saw some of the companies that reported disappointing results. Uh, including Venture, which was down by 7.7% after the first half results was down compared to the previous year. Uh, and then at the same time, we saw some of the banks such as UOB uh, having some losses in the past week as well. Okay, so what I'm going to discuss a bit more about today would be one of the banks, uh, DBS. Uh, this is a very widely followed stock. Okay, so we have actually seen the share price of DBS coming down quite significantly uh, from the all-time high of above $38 uh, to actually close at $33.57 on Thursday. And we see this very sharp correction uh, from above $36 uh, to close to $33 within a very short period of time. Okay, uh, part of it has got to do with the sell down in the global markets uh, as the recession concerns in the US actually start to rise. But we see this bounce after they reported um, their second quarter earnings. Okay, so if you're to look at the second quarter earnings, uh, it was a fairly strong set of results. Uh, we saw that the reported net profit was up by 6% compared to the previous year at about $2.8 uh, 
Um, and this was actually led by an increase in the total income of DBS, okay? So we'll go through each of the different segments to understand what is driving this improvement in profit. Okay, uh, so we start with the net interest margin. Uh, this is something that many investors are keeping a very close lookout for to understand how the net interest margin actually changes uh, with the evolving interest rate environment, okay? So if you're to look at the group uh, net interest margin, 2.14%, uh, which is flat compared to the previous quarter, okay? Uh, but if you're to look at the commercial book of uh, DBS, then we actually saw a slight rebound in the net interest margin uh, to 2.83% from 2.77% in the previous quarter. Uh, it was also higher compared to the previous year where it was at 2.81%, okay? So fairly resilient net interest margin, which actually led investors to be positive about the earnings that were reported. Okay, uh, we can also look at the fee income. Uh, and if you to look at the fee income, it was fairly resilient in the second quarter as well uh, at about 1.26 billion, okay? Uh, this would bring the total uh, fee-related income in the first half to 2.5 billion. Okay, if you were to look at where uh, the strength was, it was definitely in the wealth management business, uh, where the second quarter income from wealth management was at 186 million, an increase compared to the previous quarter, as well as the previous year. Okay, um, the other positive from DBS results would be that the credit quality remains healthy. Okay, if you look at the non-performing loan or NPL ratio, uh, it was at 1.1% in the quarter ending June. Uh, this was flat compared to the previous quarter as well as the previous year. Uh, so there's nothing that is actually driving a lot of concerns as to whether we'll see an increase in bad debt. Uh, from its loan book, okay? So while there are some signs of economic slowdown, uh, we actually see that the credit quality of DBS is still very healthy. Okay, so in terms of the guidance that uh, we see the company actually providing, uh, they are expecting that the group net interest income growth to be in the mid-single-digit percentage level, okay? Um, and at the same time, they are guiding for net profit growth to be in the mid to high single digit for 2024. Okay, so that is a positive sign in that what we see is the company is fairly confident of its profit uh, pro uh, prospects in the second half of this year, such that even with the very strong profit that we saw in 2023, uh, the bank is still expecting that we'll see further growth in the net profit in 2024. And we have already seen some of that coming through in the first half of this year uh, with the resilient uh, net interest margin, with the growth in the fee income, as well as from the fairly low non-performing loan ratio. Okay, uh, if you to look at the dividend, this was another uh, positive from DBS results as well. Uh, interim dividend of 54 cents for the second quarter of this year. Uh, which is unchanged from what it was in the first quarter, but higher than what it was in the previous year, okay? So with this, uh, we already have $1.08 of dividend per share in the first half of the year, um, and that is higher than what we have in the previous year. Okay, so at this point in time, um, the expectation is for DBS to offer a dividend yield of about 6.4%, which is higher than the historical average of about 6%, okay? Uh, and if you to look at the price-to-book ratio of DBS, now at about 1.5 times price-to-book, uh, off the recent high of 1.7 times, but still slightly above the historical average of 1.3 times. Okay, so in a nutshell, that is a summary of the DBS earnings and the latest valuation of DBS given the correction that we have seen in the share price from the all-time high. Okay, uh, next, I wanted to talk a bit about Lendly Suite, um, also reported uh, earnings last week, uh, and then we see this uh, correction in Lendly Suite's share price um, over the past few days. Okay, uh, so in terms of what was reported, uh, if we were to look at the second half of FY 2024, uh, which is ending June of the year, uh, then what we see is that the revenue and net property income 
uh, were down compared to the previous year. Um, and if you look at the distributable income, that was actually down by about 19% compared to the previous year. And distribution per unit down by about 21% to 1.77 cents per unit. Okay, so we'll break down what is driving this decline in the net property income and the fall in the distributable income that was more significant compared to the fall in the net property income. Okay, so before I go into the details, just a quick recap around the portfolio of Lenny Suite. Uh, you've got about 90% of the portfolio in Singapore uh, and about 10% of the portfolio in Milan. Okay, uh, if you look at the different asset classes, you've got uh, suburban retail at about 62% of the portfolio. Okay, that is coming from um, the asset at GEM. Uh, prime retail from Somerset 313 and then grade A commercial buildings making up 10% of its portfolio. Okay, if you were to look first at the retail assets, uh, this is where it has still been doing fairly well. Uh, the portfolio occupancy is still close to 100% and they were still able to achieve positive rental reversions from the retail portfolio, okay? Uh, but what we do see here is that there are some signs of slowdown in terms of the um, tenant sales growth uh, in the most recent half um, compared to the very strong growth that we saw with the post-COVID recovery, okay? Um, but in terms of where the asset is having more challenges would be the Milan assets, uh, where the occupancy is at about 74%. Um, what the REIT is doing is to reposition building three of the entire uh, Milan portfolio to be able to secure better rents for the asset. Okay, so this is something that we will await more updates from the REIT manager as to whether they are able to secure more tenants for building three of Milan. Okay, um, so while we saw that the net property income had a slight decline, uh, we saw a more significant decline in the distributable income. And that is because of the increase in the borrowing expense uh, for Lendly Street, okay? So if you look at the balance sheet ratio, the gearing ratio is fairly high at 41%, uh, even though that is flat compared to the previous quarter. And we saw a further increase in the weighted average cost of debt uh, to about 3.58% in the second quarter from 3.5% in the previous quarter, okay? Uh, if you look at the interest coverage ratio, the reported one is 3.2 times. But if you look at the footnote here, um, they mentioned that on an adjusted basis, uh, the co interest coverage ratio would actually be at 1.7 times. Okay, So something to keep a lookout for in terms of the balance sheet, uh, in that we have seen the going ratio actually at above 40%. Uh, the weighted average cost of debt is increasing and the interest coverage ratio is something that we need to pay attention to. Okay, if you to look at the latest valuation of Land Lease Read, uh, the price to book valuation is at about 0 0.7 times, uh, which is below the historical average, and the dividend yield is at about 7.2%, but we will keep a lookout as to the extent of the decline in the distributions and whether that will further impact the dividend yield of Land Lease Read. Okay, so uh, in terms of what to keep a lookout for in the week ahead, uh, we still have companies that are reporting their earnings. Uh, we have got Capital Land Integrated Commercial Trust reporting this week, together with ST Engineering, Genting Singapore, and CDL Hospitality Trust. Okay, uh, we also have a six-month Singapore T-bill auction on Thursday, 15th of August. And in terms of the economic data, a very key data point to keep a lookout for is the US Consumer Price Index data on Wednesday, uh, that will give us a further indication as to the likelihood of a rate cut in September and whether we are going to be expecting a 0.5% rate cut or 0.25% rate cut. Okay, so with that, I'll hand over to Sunny who will share the technical analysis with us. Hey, thanks, Gerald, for rounding up what happened in Singapore, the earnings results from DBS and Lendlease. 
So a lot of things are going through my mind after a volatile week last week. Uh, I did add it on to some position on the NASDAQ Composite Index just to be transparent with you. And of course, uh, that was just a, my trading part of my mind when it hit a, a reversal level, I would usually go in. So I always look at the charts to get some clarity on what is happening. But before I go into the charts today, I want to uh, give you some opinions of the Japanese carry trade. So since I began my career in the banking industry 10, more than 10 years ago, it's a very popular strategy used by private banks, investment banking, and hedge funds to borrow from uh, the, U the Japanese yen and then uh, buying into the US stocks or even the higher yielding uh, asset class. So that has been going on for many, many, many years. And to say that the if you were to ask me, has the Japanese yen carry trade uh, uh, reversal is, is over. I cannot 100% tell you that whether it's over or not. Hence, the reason why uh, Gerald mentioned just now, we are looking at how the Japanese yen against the US dollar is moving. And of course, I'm also looking at the CBOE volatility index, the VIX index, which spiked to a very high level last week. Okay, so these, uh, these, two, in, these two index or these two um, readings right from the Japanese, uh, Japanese yen and the VIX index will give me an indication whether there could be further or second or third round of unwinding of the Japanese yen carry trade. And I am on a very close lookout for any big movement into that. And also, I'm also looking at the uh, futures movement. So this morning, this Monday morning, uh, we can see that the futures is relatively flat. And we said earlier that most of the index recovered most of the losses at the end of uh, last week. So that is a pretty calming sign that the, the storm may be over for now, but we are I'm looking out for further dark clouds that might be ahead. So with that, I will go into the STI index and let you know why the index is uh, in an ideal setup now in a trading uh, sort of a perspective. Okay, so we saw the STI index actually went down to a low on last Tuesday and to a level close to the 3,200 point level. In fact, it touched a low of 3,198 points. And on Monday last week, on 5th of August, I actually mentioned that there is a long-term uptrend support line on the STI index. And that is the green color line that you see here connecting the low in the end of last year, 2023 together with some of the significant pullback this year in February and in the April period as well. So last Tuesday, we actually touched this support line and then there was some quite convincing rebound. So that means that this uptrend support line is a definitely a firm support line that is likely to hold for some time, at least, unless a situation, a new situation develops from some of the uh, data announcement, like the CPI data announcement that's coming up this week. So where is the resistance now on the STI? Definitely, you can see that in the past two trading session, although we have that rebound on Wednesday and Thursday on the STI, we are still kept below the red line here, which is the 200 days moving average. And today on the STI index Monday morning, we are also seeing that uh, STI is unable to break up above the 200 days moving average. Uh, anytime soon based on the uh, close to 1% drop or more than half percent drop in the STI this morning. So this uh, this area over here around the 3,250 point mark also coincides with the previous resistance level in March and in February. So it is quite likely going to provide some uh, resistance right now. Hence, if you are accumulating, accumulating on this uptrend line, the green line over here, it will take a bit of time for it to uh, break above the 200 day moving average. But once it breaks above that, as you can see in previous scenario, the uptrend used to usually is uh, quite sustainable on a longer term basis. So last Tuesday, when I was watching the STI charts touching a low of 3,200 points, I'm actually looking at the RSI indicator. It actually breached below the 30 point mark. And that is the uh, oversold level that uh, a lot of technical analysts look at. And once it hit a low of about 22 points, we know that, hey, the near term bottom, a technical correction, a technical reversal will likely be in play going forward. And hence, uh, some of the traders actually accumulated around here, the 3,200 points level, and the STI RSI reading actually improved back above the 30 point mark, the latest reading at the 32 point mark on Monday morning. So one indicator does not confirm anything. So we have the MACD indicator to confirm that trend. So the last two trading session on Thursday, on Wednesday, 
uh, on and Thursday. Sorry, the last two trading hands in today and last Thursday confirm that the downtrend momentum observed on the MAD, MACD indicator is actually subsiding right now. So that means that it gives further conviction to the RSI that indicates that the index is currently in the oversold territory and the downtrend momentum is subsiding. So this is a good area, the 3,200 points level to the 3,250 points level, somewhere in the middle of this zone area over here, is a good point of accumulation, at least in playing the technical rebound. So it will not uh, spike up immediately, but once we get the confirmation of the RSI uh, converging towards the signal line, that may be where the big movement come in. And once we have a crossover of the 200 days moving average, then further upside momentum will build up and thereby it will retest uh, some other resistance level further up, like the 100 days moving average at 3,320 points and even the uh, 50 days moving average now at 3,360 points. So there's a big sort of big gap over here that uh, we can move up on the SCI index should we be able to hold the support level and consolidate over this region over here. Okay, next let's move to the US indices. So US indices, some of the index also has formed an ideal uh, sort of a trading setup pattern that uh, allows uh, traders to get back in and accumulate on the US index. So you can see that the Dow Jones index was the most resilient among the three US indices, the 30 stocks Dow. So we also have, you can see on the indicators, we also have the uh, subsiding of the downtrend momentum that we observed in the past few weeks, in the last two trading sessions, that downtrend momentum is subsiding and there was a bit of a rebound or recovery of the losses that we have in the last uh, few trading sessions. On the RSI, we have also recovered to the 47 point a reading on the Dow Jones index. That means that although momentum is weak right now, it's not too far off from the 50 point neutral mark. So the downside risk is uh, sort of mitigated, but the support level that we are looking at for the Dow Jones index, definitely the first one that was triggered was at the 39,130 points level. That is the 100 days moving average. And of course you can take reference from the recent low on 30th May as well. That is around the level of uh, 38,039 points. So the 38,000 handle, now coinciding with the 200 days moving average at 38,100 points, the red line that we see here could be the, the key support level that we look at, okay, for the Dow Jones index. Next, let's move to the uh, broad index, the S&P 500. So the big decline earlier last week actually nearly triggered the, uh, uh, the S&P 500 index into the correction territory because we nearly touched the 10% mark from the highest point that we observed on 16th of July. But we managed to stay just above that, and then you can see that the rebound happened in the later part of the week. That means the early part of the week, the, where the index went down, is actually overdone. And the indicators is telling us that, hey, the MACD is saying that the, the converging sign is starting to appear already. You can see that the MACD line is starting to trickle upwards towards the signal line. That means that uh, a near-term bottom might have been achieved. And on the, S on the RSI, we can see that the low on Monday was actually touching the 30-point mark. Okay, It did not breach that level. But then again, at the 30-point mark, it tells us that it put the index was, is more likely in the oversold territory rather than having a, a richer valuation as what we expect earlier. Okay, So the RSI recovered to the level of 45 points last Friday as we were watching it on the National Day holiday and at night. So you can see that the S&P 500 rebounded above the 100 days moving average now at 5,300 points. So if you can build on this support level, then definitely the retesting of the uh, all-time high at 5,669 points level, that could be a possibility. But then anything below the 100 days moving average 5,300 points or 5,200 points, I think that is a zone where we want to look at to accumulate into the S&P 500 index as well. Lastly, I will go to the NASDAQ Composite Index, which I will be very transparent with you. I actually added quite a bit of position on the NASDAQ Composite Index. Why? Because firstly, on the Monday of last week, it actually starts to go towards the 30-point mark on the RSI indicator. In fact, it went to a low of 29.8. That triggered uh, the oversold signal on my charts. And then, of course, automatically, uh, in the trader mindset, I, have, I, will take, I take my first position over there on Monday. Okay? Then I observe the movement. Once the once on the Tuesday, I observe a green candle over here. I think that mark, the majority of market fear or the pullback caused by the Japanese yen carry trade would largely have subsided already. And looking at the other economic indicators, I felt that hey, we are not going into an economic downturn 
but rather waiting for the unwind of the Japanese uh, carry trade to complete. And then uh, market should be doing well going forward. Of course, looking at the catalyst of the rate cuts also, which Gerald mentioned towards the September period. So that means I added quite a bit of position on the Nasdaq Composite Index using the 200 days moving average at 16,058 points level as a key support I'm looking at, at the entry level that I'm looking at. And we are now going back towards the uh, 100 days moving average now at the 16,898 points or close to the 17,000 handle. Okay, so with both the MACD showing that the last two trading sessions, at least the uh, downtrend momentum is subsiding and the RSI having a healthy recovery, the near term low might be in. And if you uh, like to take some risk during this volatility, volatile period, this might be a area, This the area of the 16,058 points level could be the support level, key support level that you're looking at to accumulate on the NASDAQ Composite Index based on the long-term 200 days moving average support level. Okay, so this is my take on the uh, index this week. Uh, what else do we need to watch out for, Gerald? I think really it is about the consumer price index data. Uh, mm -hmm. given that a lot of the market movements has been driven by expectations of the Fed rate cut um, that will effectively provide us with a signal and indicator as to whether we'll really start to see the rate cuts coming through in September and by how much the Fed will actually cut interest rates by. Definitely. So how much the Fed cut interest rate will be the key driver because of the CPI data this week that we are looking at. And of course, there's a retail sales number right after the CPI numbers on Thursday as well. So those will be the key factors driving most of the major indices for this week. And we look forward to updating you guys on development next week as well. So I'd like to thank everyone for your time today. And we'll catch you again next week in the next weekly market review. Goodbye. Thank you.